Welcome everyone to this special event celebrating our Hancock Tower's 50th birthday. Um, as we invite architects and engineers from the 1960s skyscraper boom to our stage, we'll be hearing tonight from architect Richard Smits, engineers Joe Colasso and Dave Ruby, and with SOM's Bill Baker moderating the discussion. Everybody hear me okay? Okay. I am Joe Burns and welcoming you here on behalf of the Chicago Architecture Center. I serve on CAC's Board of Trustees, but I'm also a member of the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, CTBUH, and the Chicago Committee on High Rise Buildings, who are co-sponsoring this event with CAC. I am an architect and structural engineer and the managing principal of Thornton Tomasetti, and I want to thank the CAC staff for organizing this event and the CTBUH Chicago chapter attendees here tonight. And I especially want to thank the Hearn Company uh, as the lead sponsor of tonight's festivities. Hearn manages 875 North Michigan Avenue, also known as the Hancock Tower, and our owners of this tower's office space and parking garage. I'm extremely proud to serve on CAC's board because of the platform it offers for public discourse and our ability to bring together our, our AEC industry professionals in Chicago's architectural aficionados. I'm certain many of which are here tonight. Um, we also value our ongoing partnership with CTBUH on this quarterly Building Tall lecture series and on the exhibit content within the center's permanent skyscraper gallery. This program is a fitting lead up to the CTBUH's 10th Global Congress being held here in Chicago in late October. Uh, it too is 50 years old. And the theme of the Congress this year is 50 forward, 50 back. And the 50 back is especially resonant when thinking about Hancock's 50th birthday we celebrate this year. Several hundred leaders of the building sector will be in town from around the globe to give and attend lectures and promote the next generation of innovations in tall buildings. The story and legacy of John Hancock Center has special resonance for me as an architect and engineer. The impact for me came 45 years ago when I was a young architecture student attending a lecture by Fazlur Khan. He talked about the design of the Hancock, the Sears Tower, and other great buildings, as well as art and culture. Um, that encounter, I'm certain, changed the trajectory of my own career. We have a unique opportunity tonight to have insiders regale us with their tales of working on the design of the Hancock as young architects and engineers with SOM partners Bruce Graham and Fazer Khan. And if you are a Chicagoan, as I am, there is ubiquitous pride in this tower, the way Parisians feel about their Eiffel Tower. Bill Baker will be our host and moderator this evening. Bill was an infectious, has an infectious energy for structural design and its integration with architecture. A generous approach to sharing insights with public, and actually, it's, he's a lot of fun to be around, too. Um, Bill has led SOM structural engineering practice for over 20 years. He has dedicated himself to extending the profession of structural engineering through design, research, teaching, professional activities, and renowned for the development of the buttress core structural system for Burj Khalifa, which is well exhibited in the high, uh, skyscraper gallery. And with that, Bill helped make the world's tallest building a reality. And so with that introduction, please help me welcome Bill Baker to our stage. Uh, th th thanks, Joe. Um, Joe actually started at SOM a week before I did. And so we kind of grew up together, um, you know, working on working on buildings from around the world. Uh, the um, so I'm going to give a little introduction to this, and then what I'm going to do, um, just kind of set the stage a little bit. Then we'll invite the speakers because you don't really want to hear from me; you want to hear from them uh, up uh, on the stage, and I will then quiz them. And uh, and then after after a while, then we'll have some questions at the very end. Okay. And so to, to help set the set the stage, see if I do this right. Okay. 
Uh, I actually tra traced uh, the Hancock uh, back back to this. Uh, these two people, uh, Mies van der Rohe and, and Myron Goldsmith. Now, Myron Goldsmith was an uh, architect engineer also. He, uh, he worked on the Farnsworth House. I think he did uh, the uh, he was like project architect and also project structural engineer for the Farnsworth House. Actually, Joe and I have copies of the calculations that Myron did for the Farnsworth House. So. Uh, anyway, so, uh, but in, 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 in Myron's thesis of 1953, he studied uh, the, the Brace Tower. And then uh, after he, he went off to, to Europe and worked, uh, studied and worked under uh, Luigi Nervi, uh, ended up uh, going to, um, was hired eventually to work at S1 in San Francisco. And then he comes to Chicago and he's starting to uh, teach at IIT in the, uh, like the very early 60s. And he had this uh, thesis project with, uh, uh, with a student named Suzaki. In uh, 1964, this is the, uh, the the master's thesis where they were, and his his co-advisor was Fazer Khan, uh, and so uh, Fazer Khan, uh, Dr. Khan, uh, who uh, got his uh, doctorate down at, uh, uh, got two masters and one PhD down in Champaign, and uh, and came up to work uh, uh, for SOM. And he, um, and he, uh, they did a lot of research. You might say the, the modern tall building was invented in a one-story building on the south side here called Crown Hall. And, um, and so, uh, so with that kind of background, they had this project. This is the John Hancock uh, project, two 50-story towers. Now, uh, there was a little bit of a problem in that uh, they couldn't get the whole property. There's a, if you go there today and you go to the northeast corner, you'll see there's a little building there called the Casino Club. And they wouldn't sell, okay? And so I think there's various stories. I wasn't there. I, I you know, I did not work on the Hancock, okay? Neither did Joe. Uh, anyway, so, but they, um, uh, you know, so they had an issue. And so eventually they, they put uh, the, the resident, there's two towers, an office tower and a residential tower. You can see the, the small, a uh, smaller building would be the residential, the, the bigger one, the office. And, um, and eventually, uh, I'll let others try to describe it, they decided they ended up with one tower as, as, instead of two. And uh, here's the site, and you can see the, um, uh, up at the upper right-hand corner, that's the casino club that was the, uh, the problem that led to great architecture, okay? Uh, and and to, to, to this building itself, and so uh, we all get the pleasure of seeing the, the completed project, but we're going to talk about how it got there. And, and a little bit about the people. This is a very seminal photograph. You have uh, from left to right, Fosler Khan, uh, who is the, the structural engineer, the lead structural engineer, Bruce Graham, the lead structural uh, architect, uh, Al Lockett, uh, managing partner uh, for, for SOM, Lou Bruner from the American Institute of Steel Construction, and then Dick Linke, who was a technical architect, uh, uh, who uh, the technology side of architecture. And so this is a very, very uh, key thing. Now, I'm going to take this moment to uh, uh, explain a couple things which I really find wonderful about the Hancock. One is that it's actually a tight arch. That because if you look at the building, the rule of the Hancock is, the geometric rule of the Hancock, every time a vertical crosses a diagonal, it happens at a floor line. And because of that, you can move loads all over the floor, all over the place. So you, you can see the, the top, uh, the top uh, red triangle is just like an A-frame. So that column can be, uh, you can move load from the center column to the corners or from the corners to the center column. Uh, you, the same thing for, you have the two trapezoids. Uh, you know, so all the columns were connected together in such a way it act like a tube. Because it's actually referred to not as a, not as a truss, not as a truss building, but as truss tube, because all of the columns participate uh, in, in the building. The other thing, which I think is just wonderful, is how they told the story of the architecture. If you, um, uh, from a purely structural engineering point of view, where should that, that diagonal end? In the basement. That's where the foundation is. So not only did they not terminate the diagonal down in the basement, they didn't even stop it at the first floor. They put it one story in the air so that people could see the complete resolution of the forces in the joints. Now, but you gotta get, but the wind, but the foundation is not one story in the air. 
So what did they do? If you look through the window, you can see uh, the, the brace going, taking it down to the basement. It's not hidden, because you need it, but it's also not expressed. So that aesthetic decision of how to tell the story of the structure uh, through the architecture, I think, is, pro is really quite profound. And uh, I think very, very important. And, and, and you know, everyone gets it, even if they don't understand why they get it. And so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, invite to the stage, OK? We'll start off with, uh, with uh, Joe Colasso, uh, Dave Ruby, and uh, Rich, uh, Rich Smith. So why don't you gra grab a chair? Now, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have some slides. I get a little feedback there. Uh, we're going to have some slides that are um, uh, that are going to be rotating. Occasionally, we're going to refer to them uh, to help uh, uh, prompt some some of the discussions. And so, uh, uh, but first of all, I'd like for you to meet our uh, our participants today. The um, first of all, uh, on on my far right, I have uh, Rich Smiths. Okay. Who are you, and what was your role in the Hancock? Well, my name is uh, Richard Smits. I uh, was a young kid, fresh out of uh, IIT, and uh, came into SOM, and lo and behold, they put me on what was going to be the world's tallest building. It was an amazing opportunity, and uh, so I spent the next several years working on that and uh, helping to put it all together. Okay, Dave Ruby. Uh, well, uh, who are you and what was your role in the hand? Uh, I was a project engineer for American Bridge Division, U.S. Steel. Um, it was in 60, when we were doing this in the mid-60s, I started with American Bridge in 1956 out of high school as a draftsman while I was going to college. So then I graduated and spent two years drafting. I finally got a chance to do engineering after I got to Chicago. And um, I, for me, my experience on the Hancock, I guess I could say, is that when I was finished, I went and asked my boss, I might as well retire, because what else is there to do? <laughs> so uh, I hate, there's a question I'm really sad to ask you. What is, what is American Bridge? What is American Bridge? Well, today, they're not a lot. <laughs> um, they're primarily in the bridges today, but at that time, they had several fabricating facilities across the country. They had the capacity of doing 600,000 tons of structural steel a year. Uh, we were the largest, we were the 900 pound gorilla. Uh, we did not let, or American, I say we, American Bridge, uh, they controlled the general contractors and the construction managers. They did not tout to anybody. Uh, if you wanted American Bridge on the job, then you needed to sit down with American Bridge. Yeah. And they did that, and they continued to do that until the Twin Towers came up, and American Bridge and Bethlehem Steel decided, well, Bethlehem, you do one, I'll do the other. And the developers said, no, nah, we got another, we got a better way. So that was the end of American Bridge. Yeah. So, uh, and, and if, you, if, you go, if you drive over from uh, Chicago, if, say, you're going to, uh, to um, over to uh, Michigan, you'll see the old American Bridge uh, plants in Gary, Indiana. There's the, you can still see the signs in some of the buildings. So, uh, Joe Colasso, uh, who are you? What was your role? And uh, where were you before the Hancock? I was uh, sitting in my advisor's office at the University of Illinois in Champaign, Illinois, when he got a phone call from a former student of his named Fazlur Khan. And Faz wanted an engineer to work on a 100-story tall building. So Professor C says, why don't you go on up there and talk to him? He was a former student of mine, nice guy, very smart. So I came up here to Chicago thinking I was coming up for an interview. It was Monday morning. And Faz walked in and said, OK, here's your desk, and here's your chair. And, uh, <laughs> and there's a model of the building in the reception room. And in those days, I was a computer nerd. I had done all my work on computers. Uh, it was for by the, by the token of today, it was those of you who got computer nerds will know. I was working on IBM 1620, which had two kilobytes of memory. <laughs> and I used to code in binary with a lot of cards, punch cards going in and coming out. So I used to spend nights and nights in the computer lab. And that's what Faz was looking for. 
So when I came to work for him, he assigned me to do all the computer work. And sitting by my side was a seasoned engineer named Hal Anger, who was a senior project engineer. And unfortunately, he should be here in my place. He just passed away two months ago. Uh, but one of the finest engineers and the finest gentlemen I ever met. So uh, did you ever work on any other steel projects here in Chicago? In uh, Chicago, I did. Uh, uh, I, oh, uh, I'm sorry, you're talking about No, the Picasso. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about the Picasso sculpture. That was a very special <laughs> Sunday project. Uh, it was a top secret project, and the only maquette of the project was in uh, a senior partner, Bill Hartman's office. So on Friday night, his secretary would give me the key. And on Sunday, I could work on the project when there was nobody else around. I was not allowed to touch it. The maquette was 30 inches high and was sitting on a uh, piece of wood that rolled back and forth. And I was not allowed to touch it. So I, you know, we were going to blow it up to 50 feet high, so I needed to know the proportions. So I had to hold a ruler like this and say, OK, that's 3 and a quarter, <laughs> and it's become this big. Oh, that, uh, who fabricated that, by the way? That was done also the Ambridge plant <laughs> in Gary, Indiana. <laughs> And amazingly enough, uh, this, this you need to be proud of, they said they didn't want to take a chance on it, so they pre-erected it in Gary, imagine. There was a 50-foot sculpture sitting in their yard, and cars were driving by thinking these guys had got bonkers. Uh, <laughs> and Mr. Hartman and I used to go back and forth to, to check that sculpture out with an architect named Fred Lowe. Anyway. If, if yeah. I can add something Give about that, yeah. one thing is that what American Bridge did is they built a six foot high model of that out of birch and then tore that apart and scaled that birch up to do to fabricate it from that. We went one step further. After you did a six foot model, Freddie loaded a twelve foot model and painted it dark brown and kept it in the office. That's the only thing I had to go on because the rest of it was all top secret. I couldn't touch. Uh, could, uh, we're gonna go to some some slides here. Can you go to slide fourteen? Okay, and so I'm going to use this to ask some questions, okay? Uh, this is something we've pulled together. So here you see some construction slides. And at the very bottom is a timeline of the construction of the, of the John Hancock. So the blue line is the foundation, and the gray line is the construction of the superstructure. But there's a gap in it. Dave, what happened? Uh, <clears throat> well, exactly what happened, I don't think anybody ever really Listen, decided to do it, but one day uh, I got a phone call from my office from a field engineer who was out surveying the initial three or four stories of that structure that were up just to set up the grid because they had to plumb the building at midnight, but they wanted to make sure that their base grid was set. So he was doing it, and he calls me and he says, Dave, uh, we have a column that's sinking. Uh, so I go over there to the site. He's a young fellow, and he's not sure who to tell. I go to the site, we look at it, tell me, we, we reset the, the transit and put it back and look in that thing and look at it, and that column is sinking. So we go into the superintendent's office, and the superintendent is text twining. Um, text thinks that mother's half a word. So, <laughs> so, when it, so if you take two wet behind the ear engineers from his point of view to come in and tell him that his column is sinking. We were not particularly welcomed. <laughs> he starts talking, anyway, back, he goes out and did that, I'll do that transit, I'll get up and he looks at it and he says, son of a bitch, that column is sinking. <laughs> so that was the start of it. What was the problem? They ended up coring that particular shaft the shaft was in about the middle of the building and where the excavation for the parking structure in the back was fairly immediately adjacent. So part of that caisson was very close to the edge. But what they found about 40, I think 40 to 50 feet down, they had about a 10 foot void, or at least full of mud. Yeah. So it was just so sinking. Is, is Clyde Baker here? Did, he, did, you, did Clyde make it? Anyway, so the geotechnical engineer lives up in Evanston yeah. uh, who worked on that here. So, so Joe, the, you got the contractor telling you you got yeah, your column sinking. What, what, well, what, what do you do about that? I, I, I can take it from there. I, I got a phone call at 8.30 in the morning on a Monday from Earl Towery, who was our superintendent, SOM superintendent. He said, Joe, one of the columns is sinking in the building. I said, Earl, that, well, the survey probably had a bad night. Ask him to go do it again. <laughs> and so okay. he, he did it again, and he came back two hours later, and he said, no, that column is sinking. 
So I grabbed hold of Dr. Khan, we jumped into a taxi and went over to the site. So what do we as engineers do? I said, okay, you know, there's 10 feet of mud in this, in this caisson, or we thought it was that much, we didn't know at the time. Let's get the concrete logs. These, these caissons were 10 feet diameter and went down 140 feet. So we started checking the concrete quantities 44. in all the caissons. And we could not find the difference between the caissons to make a definitive statement. So Father says, okay, we're going to core the caisson. Well, how do you core a caisson when there was six, six stories of steel on top of you? We went to Oklahoma and we found an oil drilling guy who had a six inch diameter core drill. And we started coring the column, and sure enough, when we got down about 30, 40 feet, it just went zip through the mud. And then it picked up cores all over again. So Fa said, okay, we're gonna take four cores on this caisson. Luckily, the caisson was 10 foot diameter and the steel base plate was a little smaller, so there was room to take it. And then every time we did that, we hit mud at the same location, so we knew we had a problem. So, just I would like, to, now if I can just digress into something interesting, not in, at the time, but now it's interesting. Uh, the previous winter, there was a lady who used to write a column for the Chicago Tribune, her name was Jean Dixon, and she was a prophetess. She would look into a ball and predict what was gonna happen the next year. And that Christmas, she predicted that, oh, you know, usually Elizabeth Taylor is gonna marry so-and-so, or you know, the other one, Jacqueline Kennedy was the other one who was gonna marry so-and-so. But that year she said, Big John is coming down. He's gonna fall. <laughs> Next thing I know, two days later, it comes all the way to the food chain from Mayor Daly to Bill Hartman to Bill Graham, Faz Khan, and me. And next thing I know, I'm on the plane, they hired Paul Weidlinger in New York. They wanted a clean letter from another engineer saying the building was safe. And Dick Roots and I got on a plane in the middle of January in the cold, uh, cold of winter in New York and sat down with Paul Weidling, and Paul Weidling said, no, the building is just fine. So he said, write us a letter. And that letter went to Mr. Daly, and then that thing died down. But then the fun began, and I might just praise SOM just for a second. They set two groups up. One was the engineering group that Dr. Khan ran, and Hal and I were part of that group. And then there was another group, take care of lawyers, insurance companies, and, and all that <laughs> stuff, publicity. Because what happened was within two or three weeks, Jerry Wolman, the developer, declared bankruptcy. And the whole thing went into a complete tailspin. Uh, luckily, in a over a long period of time, the John Hancock people stepped in and took the project over. But Faz insisted that we core every case on in the job. And the cores were lined up on one of the lower floors. There's 40,000 cores that just went all the way across. And luckily, that case on was the only bad one we had some others that were, had some bad concrete in spots, but nothing serious. But that whole process took the timeline that Bill's talking, it took all of six months. And it was just touch and go whether the building would go ahead or not. And these good people at Ambridge, they kept on fabricating steel. <laughs> so Faz said, you go down to Gary and be sure that steel is protected and all that. So I used to drive from, Houston, from Chicago all the way to Gary and meet with their people. Charlie Sears was wonderful, by the way. Yeah and they were very, very professional. We took all the steel, covered it up and all that. But uh, steel, eventually when the project went ahead, it went up very, very fast. So, so Rich, what was it like to be an architect on a building where every floor is different? That, uh, that's, that was one of the real challenges uh, of the project. Uh, but also in my mind, it's what makes uh, the, the strength of that building, it becomes for me, the real icon of the city of Chicago. And, and for me, it's, uh, it's, it's really an architectural masterpiece. And I'll tell you why. In my uh, definition of architecture, is that it is that it's a synthesis of a whole series of uh, architectural uh, or of, of various building systems and components, uh, the structure the mechanical, the electrical, the plumbing, and the all the architectural elements all coming together in, in a way that makes the, uh, the sum of all these uh, things, the result is greater than the sum of all the parts. And that's because it's also driven by a, uh, a d overall design concept. And that was the whole idea of uh, the diagonal bracing, putting the structure on the outside of the, uh, 
the wind and the uh, load-bearing structure primarily on the outside of the building. And, uh, and then it's, it's done in a way that, uh, uh, that really enhances the, uh, the, occup the, the occupancy of the building. Now, what it means to work on a building that's, that's sloping, uh, well, when you get down in the lower part where it's uh, simply parking, uh, well, 40 feet, 35 feet uh, from the core of the building to the outside wall, that works. <coughs> offices, uh, not too big a problem. You lay it out a little differently with the offices and the desks and so on. When you get up into the apartment areas, it really starts to, to change. And, uh, and what we ended up doing is having uh, groups of, of uh, apartment plans. And it was, uh, I think, five different groups. And as the, the building got uh, narrower and narrower, all the layouts started, uh, had, had to change. And uh, so that was done in, in, in five groups. And what also happened, because of the diagonal uh, bracing in the exterior and the, the geometry of that, the floor, the floor to floor heights changed. So it went from nine foot six to nine foot three to nine foot. And uh, so all that added to the, uh, the complexity of it. And it was a real challenge. But, uh, <coughs> but in my opinion, the, uh, the, the layouts worked uh, really, really well. We spent, uh, I remember Neil Anderson, uh, who spent uh, just days and days and days working on all of these different right. uh, arrangements of the floor plans. The, the, um, um, let's, go, let's go to slide, if we could, go to slide um, 19, okay? Okay, how old were these people? Okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I did a little work. Uh, Bruce was, uh, was 39 or 40 years old. Foz was 35 when this thing started. Uh, the the uh, Al Lockett, he's a tall guy over there. Uh, he was he was the old guy, 42. Okay, uh, you know, working on this project. So and ha they often uh, said that Hancock was built by kids. <laughs> <laughs> that's not far from true. <laughs> yeah. The. Um, Let's, let's also go to, if we could, uh, let's go to slide uh, 29. Let's talk about OSHA. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Dave, uh, as, a, as, a, as a guy who used to walk the beams, what was it like to be up there? Well, I, I have told my wife several times that uh, the building was very, very interesting and, and, instruct, and fun to be with until they put the glass in. <laughs> but uh, yes, we, as you'll see here, for those of you who have seen structures go up, you very, very seldom see an open floor. In that particular floor system there, uh, at one time, the erected steel was 22 floors above a finished diaphragm. Uh, we ran away from the concrete contractor. However, that started, if I can tell the little story. Sure, go ahead. In the initial meetings with this, with Tishman, with the general contractor and the concrete and the steel contractor, and I was in part of the erection procedure, so I was a little mouse in the corner, uh, the concrete contractor boasted that he was going to push the steel contractors off the site. They'll just blow you people away. We're going to pour concrete up. Well, the one thing I've learned in my life is never challenge an iron worker. <laughs> no. What's the union local number here? Local one. Local one. Local one, and they'll, they will tell you, they will let you not forget that. We're local <laughs> one. Well, anyway, they just took off. And so we got to the point when we were having conversations with, with Fez with regard to the fact that, oh, we don't have a diaphragm. So we. Our, we were doing, now we didn't have the computer capabilities you had. We had a computer in, Monro in Monroeville, Pennsylvania. So we would do 
cart sheets and put all the things and send that out for a key punch, then the key punch would be printed, then we'd check that to see if that was right, <laughs> then we'd send them back and do it, and we would have quick turnaround in 14 days. <laughs> so <clears throat> we did analysis and came down to a fact where we put a, a, a diaphragm on in the floor, but actually with eight by eight by one angles, uh, from one corner to the other across the building on every eighth floor. Uh, and they remained there until the concrete got up within a floor of that, then we would take that off and then they would continue. The, the, when American Bridges were going to run away from the contractors, they were going to beat the concrete people and they did. So, so uh, Joe, you, 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 were, you were a computer whiz. Yeah. So what the heck is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is a Highly technical slide, but <laughs> if you look on the left-hand side, it says M-E-M-N-O, which stands for member number. I gave a number to every member in the frame, so the 412 is the first one. And zero indicated the top end or the left end, and one was the right end or the bottom end. And then there's nine uh, factors over there. They're all the stresses in that member under gravity lows, wind and lock, broad face, wind and narrow face. And then you have to combine them all. And the, the key to looking at this is somewhere towards the fourth from the right, you see EFFGR. That number has to be less than one. Otherwise, the member's overstressed. And the member right next to it is EFFWL, which stands for wind load. And under the old codes, it had to be less than 1.33. Otherwise, the member was overstressed. So I had to check all the members from top to bottom. I checked them two or three times. The changes were made and satisfied Dr. Khan that this was so, so uh, how quick was your turnaround on your calculations? It was pretty fast because Faz made us work 70 hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a bachelor in those days, had a little red car, but uh, he didn't want me chasing women. He said, let's do this job. So. <laughs> 35. The, the, um, uh, Dave, um, what the heck is this thing? <laughs> Well, the unique thing about the structure of the, because the, what was used on here, what you're seeing there is what might be called a creeper derrick. Um, it has a, have a base frame and then you have a stiff leg derrick up on top of a frame, etc. Uh, what that type of construction was used for was building the towers of suspension bridges and this particular equipment here was used on the Mackinac Bridge. Uh, and uh, it was the first time it was used building a building structure. They had never done that before. The uh, question would be is how do you feed a structure um, because this building sits in between a bunch of one-way streets. So you've got to be able to get in and get out of the site and be able to feed it. So in order to do this, we needed to have four cranes, one on each face which means we had to feed four cranes. There was no storage at the job site. Everything was erected off the back of the truck. So those trucks were loaded to a schedule. They were shipped to a schedule. They came up through into Chicago and would stage on the streets off to the west uh, and pull in when the time was set. Uh, and we really got no problems with the police at all to do that. However, if a concrete truck would come up and stage someplace, he would get a ticket. <laughs> uh, the, that is local number one. <laughs> <laughs> local one, right. And so, uh, so what we see here is one of the initial derricks in position on the, at the lower levels of the floor. Let's go for some slide. What the heck is this? That is, the, uh, that is a corner column at the lower level that sits on a 26, 27 ton base plate. Uh, this particular element that we're seeing here is being finally checked before we shipped it downtown. Uh, there's a series of photographs on this. Uh, this is the corner of the second floor on Hancock? Yes. yes. Those steel plates you're looking at are six inches thick. And I had to strain, since I worked in a testing lab at the University of Illinois, Dr. Kahn made me go down there in the cold winter in these unheated well, that, fabricating absolutely, plants. Absolutely, absolutely. And <laughs> take strain gauge measurements on all these gusset plates. Now, um, uh, your friend, my old boss, Hal Angar, used to say there was an event that happened while they were fabricating the first one. That's true. What was that event? Uh, <laughs> what happened essentially was they started getting cracking in the wells. When you you put a hot uh, 
bead of weld on cold steel, it starts to shrink. And when it shrinks, it develops a crack. So that's what got Faz all excited and said, you go and strain gauge those gusset plates and check them out. And I heard there was a big bang. I, I didn't. I came afterwards, so I didn't hear the bang. But, yeah. but I know there was a bang in the office. There was a, a lot of discussion in the office about what to do about it. So Faz came up with this notion of strain gauging it. Did you go to 47? And you will on that's that slide. You will see that's the, the thing we I put strain gauges on, and we changed the welding procedure, put the strain gauges on, and then stress relieved this. Took it to the plant of Chicago Bridge and Iron and put it in an oven and gradually cooled it to relieve the stresses. Then it came back to the fabricating plant and then came back to the site. Right. So that, <clears throat> it, it took a lot of precautions. There was a lot of testing and me measuring done on it. I heard there was a note on the drawing that says, stress relieved as required. Right. <laughs> a very valuable note, it, it turned out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let, let me just make one more point. Uh, that There was a very, very close col collaboration between SOM Structural Group and Ambridge. Art Arndt and George Wright were there almost every week. And I understand that they made, we gave them four sheets of pricing drawing. That's all we had for a 100 story tall building. And they committed to 42,000 tons at $450 a ton. And so anytime we deviated and added something to it, Art would come running from wherever he was and start to beat on us. And the same with Faz, he, he would also do the same thing. At the end of the day, I understand it came right in the budget and there was a small overrun of what, 50,000 bucks or yeah. something for yeah. some changes that somebody wanted. So, so, Rich, what was it like working with uh, engineers, architects, and contractors during the design? I learned a lot with that. And it, it actually impacted my, my whole career from then on. I loved that process. We, I don't know if it was done before. It was called, uh, we called it a scope job, in which uh, at, the, at the early design phases of a project, uh, they, went, they convinced the owner to, uh, to get a construction manager, to get the contractors, and uh, to work with all of our engineers in the office, and to, uh, to work together to develop a project. And uh, by the time the, the drawings were done, it was almost like Joe was saying, uh, each contractor guaranteed the maximum price for, for his work, whether that was mechanical, or electrical or plumbing systems, it was all locked in very early in, in, the, uh, in the job. And what it did is it's, it's really sped up the whole process. Unfortunately, we had the gap in there with the <laughs> foundation. But uh, it sped up the whole process, and it was a wonderful way to work, uh, to get uh, people in each one of the engineering disciplines and each one of the contractors to come together, sit down, and talk about what worked and what didn't work. And if the architect said, say, you know, what if we did this instead of this, they would come up with ideas to help you accomplish that particular design idea. In my opinion, it's an ideal way to work. I agree with that. Yes, absolutely. You know, we see some pictures here. I'm going to make a short break. I'm going to ask Mike Tilk to stand up. Uh, yeah, so stand up. Go ahead if you can. <laughs> if you can, can you get, oh, you don't have your... There. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anyway, so 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 Mike Mike worked for Joe. Is that right? Yeah. Or worked with Joe yeah. on, on yeah. this thing? So, yeah. so on some of these, uh, you, there we have some in some of the pictures, perhaps. Anyway, so uh, of course uh, Mike had a long-term career here with George Wright from American yes. Bridge. So they, mm -hmm. they brought off and, and 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 created their own their own company. Thanks, Mike. What a good call. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The, the, yeah. Yeah, Mike was the youngest of the bunch. <laughs> so, uh, so American Bridge it was was the nine hundred pound gorilla, right? Right. Yep. So uh, yeah. I'm sure there was a lot of pomp and circumstance with getting this thing going. Talk about uh, setting the first column. Well, I would good. Uh, yes, and it would be a good idea. Slide was I had it picked up here. Slides about number. 36, let's start with 36. 
and then we'll go to 37, et cetera. Okay, that, that is the, the column that you can see, but understand, and if you're looking at it, the guy is he's looking up <clears throat> on the left-hand side. Uh, so we, that's a corner column. So I have girders out this way, and I have gusset plates out this way. That thing is about 13 feet tall and weighs and it, yes, 40 tons. And it's at a point in time that, in fact, the center of gravity of it is not really on center, and we're going to ship that on a piece of, on a truck. So, but we have to be able to lift it, put it on the truck, and set it down. So, as you go to the next slide, this is the tr this is they're unloading this truck in here. And so, in order to do that, we had to design special hinges or lifting mechanisms to make sure that we lifted it level. We did not want that to swing. It would be d very dangerous, but we could damage it, and we didn't want to do that. Probably more like damage the truck than to damage the car. <laughs> but to lift it, but in fact, once we lifted it, we were lifted to a point and then the lower end would be lowered and we'd have be holding the, the column up with one crane. However, it's not at the proper angle to be erected because that angle is sloped on both. So the crane that was on the tail end, he had to let go. The truck would drive out of the site because there was no room. Then that tail crane would go up and walk around behind the other crane that's holding it and then attach itself to the, another hitch. And once he let go with that, the other guy would, the first crane would let go, he'd have the hitch, the column would then follow into the double bevel and set. And he swung it over. At this time, we had stands there for the dignitaries to see this. Probably 40 or 50 people were there, including the mayor, and I think the governor, etc. <clears throat> and they set that column. And I'm standing there, and I'm looking at it, and I did that. In a, probably 45, 50 minutes, it was like, like clockwork. I said to myself, you know, it looks like they'd done this before. I said, but they couldn't have possibly done it. I go to Tex, Tex Twining. I said, Tex, that went like, that's just a super. I said, it looked like you'd done that before. He said, well, it is, it was. We <laughs> set that son of a bitch at 4.30 this morning. <laughs> Okay, now, <laughs> that truck cannot be on the city streets before 9 o'clock in the morning and can't be there after 3 o'clock in the morning, 3 in the afternoon. But they brought it in at 4 3 o'clock, brought it in, set down, set those two cranes, put up lights, set that column in the dark. After they got it set, they pick it up, put it back on the truck, sent the truck back out of town. <laughs> So the next day when it came in, and, and I said, well, that's pretty, he said, well, you know, you, you think I'm going to let a couple wet behind engineers ruin my reputation? <laughs> he said, uh, absolutely, he said, I'm not. And then he turns around, he says, you did a hell of a job on the design of those hitches. They work perfect. <laughs> that was our first experience with it. Right. So um, the, you know, this building is legendary. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask each of you, uh, what was it like to work with uh, Bruce Graham and Faz Khan and Al Lockett and, and, and Dick Linke? So Rich. Yeah. Uh, it was great. Can you imagine a guy coming right out of college with a bachelor's degree and being invited to sit at a conference table along with the chief designer and the chief engineer in the office and to listen to the ideas that they had. That was, it, it was an amazing opportunity. Uh, Dr. Khan was one of the kindest uh, men that I've ever worked with. Uh, he, you could never ask a question that he considered dumb. He would always explain Absolutely. why. Yes. Uh, to have that impacted, uh, me for, in a way that when I be, ended up in positions like that as project uh, uh, architects or those that are manager to treat those that were working with me to treat them with dignity and involve them in the process so that they also become owners of what's, uh, what's taking place. It was, it was an ideal for me, an ideal situation. So, so, so Dave, how much interface did you have with those, those folks? Well, I had the pleasure of working out of American Bridges office under George Wright. 
uh, and Charlie Sears, who was one of the other senior people. And uh, George was a stickler for details, uh, and he wanted things done properly. But he also would allow you the opportunity to make a mistake uh, and then walk you back through something to how's the house something might get done. Uh, and I sat in on many of these meetings with uh, Fez and with George, and I would echo your comment about Fez. There was no question that he ever perceived that he would talk down. He would actually explain anything you wanted, any question you had. He even, but he would encourage conversation from anyone yeah, around yeah. the table. Anybody could have input into the conversation. Uh, everyone, as far as he was concerned, was an equal. Uh, we're going to build this structure. We want the best ideas. It was an awesome experience. Uh, another comment I have about uh, Bruce Graham and the way he uh, functioned as the, uh, yeah, the design partner for the, for the project and all the other projects I worked with him on, that he did not micromanage. He gave the people that were working for him the concept of what he wanted to do and he let you go with it. And he would reel us in <laughs> if we started to go too far afield. But he gave us that freedom, and it was a great way to work. Yeah. So, so uh, Joe, I mean, you had the same thesis advisor as, as Foz. You both were students of uh, Chester C's. Uh, how was it uh, for you uh, working with Bruce and, and Bruce and Foz? Uh, I didn't have a lot of direct interaction with Bruce on Hancock. I had a lot more with him on the succeeding projects. But he would come in back and forth, and he would be talking mostly to Faz and to Bob Diamond and people like that. Uh, I did see him on a couple of occasions after the building was built. But with Faz, uh, it was all day long. I mean, it was, he was the most brilliant engineer I've met in my career. He was also the most hardworking. And the amazing thing about it was he could feel structures in his bones. He would always tell me, I feel it here. Like you say, you know, I put a load on my head. I can feel it going down my neck and then going down all the way to my feet and to my shoes. That's how you would inter interpolate how structures were working. He was also a workaholic. I, he made us work, Hal and I used to work 60, 70 hours a week. We were both bachelors and wanted to chase girls in those days. But he wouldn't let us do that because, and we couldn't complain because he'd work 80 hours a week. And he would always come in on Friday with a new problem which had to be solved on Monday morning. So, uh, but I, in all my years, I, I have never ever encountered an engineer as brilliant as he was. Uh, talking about uh, uh, this one diagram, did, was there something that was a surprise to him on this one? <laughs> yes, this was the only time I caught him flat-footed, which is amazing. Uh, when I started doing all these computer things, I was. One of the jobs I had was to size all the members in, in the structure, the columns, the beams, the diagonals. And so I made small models of each one of these things, and I started to try to figure out how, how the structure was working. And if you look at this slide carefully, you'll see on the top there are two arrows pointing down, each with a load which is called 70K, which stands for 70,000 pounds. And there are seven, seven columns across the face of that, this is the long face of the building. So if, you put, if there were no diagonals and you put 70,000 pounds on a column, that load will go straight down the column and be 70,000 pounds at the foundations. But you look at this one and you see what happens at the bottom, all the columns share the load equally and they only have 20,000 each. So this behaves like a, what we call a truss. And so I went and showed that to Faz and he said, you're wrong. And uh, what he had done was in the previous slide that Bill showed about the thesis at IIT, he had made a balsa wood, balsa wood model of the diagonal bracing, and he held it at one end and he pushed down on it the other way, and so he felt it was very, very strong. So essentially what he was doing, if you look at a building like this, he was pushing it for the wind loads. So he had designed the whole diagonal system for the wind loads. What I was telling him is when you have vertical loads, the load distributes very easily. So he said, go talk to Hal Anger. He'll, he'll straighten you out. Because I was a young kid. <laughs> so I went to talk to Hal. Hal had written the computer program for these trusses. And so he, we went through numbers, 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 numbers. And on Saturday, Hal said, no, your numbers are right. Go talk to Faz again. 
So I walked into his office at 9 o'clock Monday morning and I said, Father, I want to talk to you about the Lord. He said, of course you're right. He said, you should think about it. The Lord is here and it's going down the diagonal. It distributes all the way down and it comes out even. I said, oh, that was a relief. <laughs> but he walked into the office that day and said, make all the columns at any level the same size. And this, my heart aunt was very, very happy. He said, oh my God, we saved 50 bucks on this one. Yes, we did. This is the, I talked about earlier, the rule of the Hancock. Every time a, a vertical crosses a diagonal, there's a floor line. That there's a beam there that can take the thrust that, that allows all these forces to, to, to move around. So when you, next time you look at the Hancock, let your, your, let your eye tra trace, trace the, uh, the structures. Just, can I tell you one more thing parenthetically? Sure. Uh, we had two interactions with Mayor Daly. I just mentioned one when, when Gene Dixon did a number on us. Uh, there was a time when about uh, halfway through the project, Foss came running to me again. And uh, Mayor Daly had gotten uh, called Bill Hartman, that's who his contact was. And in those days, for those of you who are old enough to remember the Vietnam War, kids were blowing up ROTC buildings. So Mayor Daly wanted to know from Bill Hartman, what will happen if somebody blows up this building? So it came down the food chain and Foss came to me and said, Joe, you need to run an analysis assuming that somebody blows up the building. So I went down, and there was a guy named Laverne Ellis, you remember, the plumbing engineer. Mm -hmm. He used to be a demolition expert in the Korean War. I said, come here, Laverne, and get, put a bomb in this building and show me where you'd put it. And Laverne was first different. No, I'm not a bomber. I'm just a <laughs> <laughs> So he, he typically picked what you would imagine was the corner joint on the, ground, on the ground floor of that building. It's actually the second floor. So I re-ran all the computer analysis, took that support out, and short fires of the building would still stand up. It would lean quite a ways, but it would not fall. This building is very conservatively designed. And so he took it all the way up to Mr. Hartman, and that thing went away. So there were a lot of things we did we, we couldn't talk about on, on this building. The, uh, okay, so you're, you're, uh, it's uh, mid-1960s. You're going to do a 100-story building. There hasn't been anything anywhere near this since the Empire State Building. And uh, conventional construction, conventional 40-story buildings are, um, can be pretty expensive, but depending on how you do it. Uh, Joe, why don't you talk to what we're seeing here? Uh, what Faz did was, uh, as Bill mentioned originally, there, were, there was this, the concept of these two towers, 50-story towers. And they were going to put one on top of the other. So obviously people said, oh, there's going to be a lot of steel in this building. So Faz meticulously went and started calling his friends and buddies in the other engineering companies, steel companies, and so on. And he had plotted all the steel quantities. What he did was came up with a parameter, which is so many pounds of steel per square foot of the area. And that's what the vertical axis that's is? That's the vertical axis on this chart is pounds per square foot. And what you can see is as you keep getting taller, the amount of pounds per square foot keeps going up. And if you run your eye up to 100 stories, this one actually stops at 70, you'll see you'll get an enormous amount of steel. You'll come up with almost 70 pounds a square foot. And what Faz did based on his experience at IIT, he went in and boldly told Bruce, I can do this building if you give me diagonals and you give me a tapered shape, I'll do it for 35 pounds a square foot. And so, whenever we came into the office, that was the target. You had to come in 35 pounds a square foot. And how'd you do? We came in at 29.7. <laughs> and if you look at that chart over there, and you see the, the buildings that are marked, for example, the Equitable Building in Chicago, which is only about 40 stories tall, a little less, has got 30 pounds a square foot. And Hancock is way off to the right at 29.7. I made the mistake one time in a meeting saying, oh, I just rounded it up to 30 pounds a square foot. And Faz slapped me down. He said, no, no, it's 29.7. <laughs> it's like selling shoes. It's 29.95. Go to, there's a slide here towards the end, I think. Uh, let's see. Where is it? Anyway, um, as some of you may know, there, um, one time Faz and Myron had a, a young German student. Uh, where is it? Uh, no, it's just... Page uh, 16. Uh, young German student named uh, Helmut Jan. Okay, and, and you talked to so since since, uh, since Helmut studied under Myron and and, and Foz and me 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, you ask, you ask uh, how about Elon? He knows this number, okay? I, I told him. <laughs> because it was, uh, you know, because it was, it was drilled into you that this is, and, and uh, what is this chart we're seeing here? This, what we did on this one was uh, the building is built, you know, you've got the X's, and Faz decided to call each one of them a tier, T-I-E-R. So the bottom one was tier one, the next one tier two, and so on and so forth. We took the steel quantities in that area, tier one, divided by the area of that tier and came out of the same pounds per square foot. So if you look at the diagram on the left-hand side, the first tier has got about 42 pounds a square foot. And as you go to tier two, it comes in at about 33. Tier three drops to about 29 and keeps on going like this. And the average of all of them comes out to 29.7. That's what uh, he was shooting for. And yeah. we, we came in below the estimate we had given Ambridge, so he was very, very happy with that. So, um, I understand there was some discussion about removing the top diagonals. Yes. When you, what's, what's the story and on Paz that? said, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> and Bruce said, hell no. Yeah. So, yeah, there was actually a big debate about uh, removing the, the top diagonals. There's a big diagonals. restaurant on the 95th floor, as you remember. And they said, can I tell my story of the diagonals no, in the apartment? Sure. Go ahead. Yep. All right, I'll tell you another story about diagonals, which is even better. I, the building was finished and it was being leased. 18. And I was sitting in Bruce Graham's office on another project when the leasing agent in this building, this whole that one right there, uh, called up and said there was a lady who had rented an apartment. And it, it was the apartment where the diagonals cross. And those diagonals were blocking your view. So he wanted to know if you could take those diagonals off. <laughs> Well, Bruce Graham uh, had some Peruvian blood in him, so he first swore in English. Then he swore in Spanish, which I understand. So I started cracking up laughing. And then finally he had the punch word to this uh, real estate agent. He said, you know, if you were smart, you would tell the lady that she has to pay double rent for that apartment because it's got more steel than anybody else. <laughs> That's the way Bruce, Bruce thought. <laughs> so, um, uh, so eventually the building was opened, uh, you know, officially opened in 1970. You know, I guess it was top, topped out in maybe 68. And you all went on to, to other things. So, uh, so let me ask each of you. So Rich, where was this in your, how does this fill, fill in your career and then what happened afterwards? Well, after, uh, after this particular one? Yeah, or, or how was this as far as your, your career? Uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, Bruce uh, found out that I was willing to travel and willing to travel with the family. So we ended up uh, living and working in oh, five or six different countries over my uh, career, including uh, London and Rotterdam and uh, Cairo, Egypt and Hong Kong and Seoul, Korea and, and so on. And, uh, and often uh, one of the things that I learned is get the decision makers involved as early as possible in the process. And that included getting the code officials uh, on board uh, as you were developing, developing a project. Because instead of then having an adversarial kind of relationship, uh, they help to solve the problems that we have. So that has, uh, that has, has been a, a, a real uh, benefit for my career. The other thing that happened to me is, you know, I was only there for, for several months when uh, Dick Linke and Ferd Sheeler sent me off to uh, uh, Couples Products, a manufacturer for the exterior wall of the building. And they just simply wanted me to go there and watch how they extruded aluminum so that I had a sense of how this uh, should be done. And then I was sort of sent over there to watch how they were going to build the, uh, the mock-up for testing. Uh, the wall to make sure that the, the air infiltration coming in under different wind conditions and the water and so on, how resistant it was to both of us. It was, it was an incredible experience. You, you have to go there to see it. They, they, they build this mock-up full size, uh, about three floors, and uh, they back up to it. It's an aircraft engine and turn it and put a rack of uh, spray hoses against it and turn up that engine full blast and it is pumping that wall and we're on the inside looking for any water that may come. <laughs> so, so, so Dave, uh, let's, what happened after Hancock for you? Uh, well, Sears Tower, 
I, was, uh, I worked on the connection design of that and was going to be involved in the erection procedure when Aon Tower, or the Standard Oil Tower, took over. So I moved over and worked with Al Picardi on the final design, final details for the uh, Standard Oil Tower and during the erection procedure. Uh, I then uh, left and went to Atlanta, was chief engineer for John Portman and Associates for about six years until the mid-70s when interest rates were around 18%. And I went, left and went to Detroit and worked for a design builder, or a fabricator wanted to be a design builder. And then I decided I was just frustrated dealing with other people's problems. I wanted to create my own. <laughs> so I started my own business in, uh, 19, in 84. And, and I understand uh, we had trouble finding you because you were out driving your... I'm sorry? Uh, we, we were trying to find you. We were having trouble finding you. What, what were you doing when we were trying to call you? Oh, <laughs> well, what, we were uh, in London at the time when you called that first time. We were at my niece's wedding. Yeah. And I'm getting a phone call while we were there about this project. And yeah, I was very interested about this and that we're at the wedding. Uh, and I said, I, I'll try to get back to you as soon as I get back in the States. But, so, yeah. the, the next time you were out driving your 19, what? Uh, well, the other time I was driving my, uh, my second love, I guess, because I have my first one here. But my second love is, is a 57 uh, Corvette, a fuel-injected <laughs> four-speed. So, 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 Joe, tell us, tell us about your life after Hancock. Uh, first, I just sort of want to wrap up the Hancock thing. That, uh, in all my practice, which now goes 55 years, this is the most brilliant conceived building and executed building that I've ever worked on. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are a lot of issues that came up that we were pioneers in, in uh, solving them. Uh, Rich mentioned the, the windows. We did the first wind tunnel test on this project at the United uh, Lab in, in Hartford, Connecticut. We got the wind pressures on the entire building. And I had to plot all those by hand for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And that formed the basis of the wind load charts for that. We did a tremendous analysis on being sure the building would not have what we call resonance. Some of you remember the Tacoma Narrows Bridge that collapsed. That's what we call resonance. And we had to be sure that that one would not happen on this one, which we did. Uh, we took care of a lot of problems, like there was the swing pool on the, on the sky lobby level. Fars wanted to know how big a wave would there be in the pool. We took care of that. So there, there were lots of issues like that, strain gauging of things, we're testing at the University of Illinois and all that. But to, uh, career-wise, I left SOM in 69, went down to Houston, Texas, which was booming at the time, and uh, went to work for another company. And then in 75, I started my own firm uh, with one guy who used to be at SOM and left long before I did. And I maintained that till 2010. Now, 35 years I ran that firm, and we did big buildings everywhere. Uh, Faz had told me when I left here that from here on out, it's only downhill. <laughs> <laughs> and that proved to be true until I ran into Bill Baker on the Bur Burj Khalifa in Dubai. And I did the peer review for that. So that's the only one I've done taller than the Hancock <laughs> building. But I've done a lot of buildings in the 50 to 75 story range yeah. all over. The the United States and some around the world. Okay. All right, so now I believe we're going to have questions. So um, the, there's uh, uh, various people with microphones. I'm sure here's the chance, okay? These, these are the guys who did it, all right? So uh, well, what are your questions about that? Thank you very on. much. I lived in the building in 1970, then was away for several decades and now lived back. If you were, 50 years later, if you were building this building now, what would be different? Well, I'll tell you just one thing that uh, one of the uh, engineering partners at SOM told me last week. Uh, Hancock was an all-electric building. The t trend right now, today, is that new buildings are going all-electric. He said Hancock was 50 years ahead of time. <laughs> so what would you do differently? Uh, the concept of diagonally bracing a building, what this, the system Faz called a diagonally braced tube, uh, is still the most intelligent thing, so I would not change that. Okay. Uh, what has happened since then is uh, codes have changed. We have much higher wind loads. We also have some seismic loads to worry about. 
So we'd have to take care of that. The one thing that was not mentioned here was uh, uh, Dave was mentioning that we had the concrete slabs away behind on the steel. Uh, originally, when we designed the building, in typical steel construction, we used what we call corrugated metal deck. It's a steel deck that you put between the beams and you pour concrete on top of that. Well, in those days, there was only one company that made that deck, Inland Ryerson, and they decided to jack up the prices. And so Tishman said, forget it, we will just put wood form work and we pour all these slabs in place. And that was a tough way to go. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. If I do another building now, we will use metal deck right. uh, to make the, the building come out. But other than these small type of things, I would not change anything. I still think it's a fantastic idea. It's also a multi-purpose building. It's got everything in one building. There are people who live upstairs and work downstairs. So I think it's a perfect uh, metaphor for urban living. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I was promoting this very heavily in the 70s and 80s to have more multi-use buildings, but never happened. We still have individual buildings, office buildings, and then people commute 20 miles to get to their office. So I don't know, but I think it'll come about eventually. Was this the world? It wasn't the first, it must have been one of the very first mixed use buildings in, in the world, right? I think so, yeah. I, we've never done another one. Yeah. Never have. Okay. Other questions? This is your chance. All right. How was it getting the elevators put in there? Had you ever had an elevator in a building so tall before? I'm not sure I quite understood the question. I'm, the elevators. Yeah. How was, I mean, had you had ever experience with buildings that tall, trying to get these elevators, do, do they go all the way up continuously? Do they move to different floors? Well, uh, I don't, uh, you know, being involved somewhat in the, in the uh, development of the elevator system, uh, but working very closely uh, with the Otis Elevator Company, uh, I, uh, we ended up, I, I believe, with the uh, elevators that uh, go to the, uh, the restaurant and the observatory were at that time, I believe, the fastest elevators in the world. And uh, I don't know if it takes about 35 seconds to go from, uh, from the uh, lobby at the bottom up to the top. Uh, the elevators for, for the uh, other areas, there, you know, there's uh, parking areas, there's office areas, there's apartments, and, and there's observation and so on at the top. Each one of those uh, uh, occupancies has to have its own elevator system. You don't want to be able to, to uh, yeah, uh, mix up the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the occupancies. So there are places where you can transfer, uh, but typically when you develop an elevator uh, uh, system like that. You want, you want to arrange it such that when you're standing in an elevator lobby, you don't really, the maximum amount of elevators in any given zone would be eight. Better have six. So you don't have to walk so far because there's a, a very definite time period that people are willing to wait uh, to go to it, for the elevator to come and get to their, their stop. So all of that was very carefully calculated. I believe there's three zones of elevator uh, of, uh, of offices in, in the building. Each one served by its own lobby and uh, about five or, or six uh, elevators. I think the top one is five elevators. Uh, there's a place where you can transfer from one to the other. So if you've got two adjacent floors, you can uh, uh, go there. The other, uh, for the apartments, uh, in order to maintain security and so on, there's an entrance lobby on the north side of the building, I believe, and that's uh, just for the apartment dwellers. And they have uh, elevators that, uh, that go express up to their, the uh, apartment lobby, and from there it's split up into uh, uh, about three zones also, I believe. I think all in all, there's about 50 elevators with, uh, within but, that building. But, but, but prior to this, I mean, today there's tall buildings flying up all over the world. But prior to this, you know, the, you had to go back to the Empire State to find a building that was even in this neighborhood. So I mean, mm -hmm. did you have to like dust off over old technology or break, make new one, make new technology? Yeah. I'll just add parenthetically that the the high-speed elevator that goes from the ground to 95th floor is a 1,600 feet a minute, which at the time was the fastest elevator in the world. 
And I've ridden that elevator many times when I was a young man, and it, was, it would pop my ears. <laughs> but there are a lot of buildings going up in China which have even faster elevators than that. I don't know how they work it, but I can't believe old people will ever ride those elevators. <laughs> <laughs> well, something but, else to keep in mind is that uh, the, the weight of the cable. The, the greater the rise, the, the, uh, the, the greater the weight of the cable, and that really starts to affect it. And that has changed the design of the cables to uh, fiber, uh, kind of yeah, a fiber. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Burj Khalifa had the world's tallest elevator at the time, it was 500 meters, now they, they can go taller, the Kevlar cables. My impression just from living in Chicago recently is that steel structures are no longer being built. It doesn't appear, everything seems to be poured concrete where it's pumped up a hundred stories or something. Is steel now obsolete or is, is will, will steel buildings like this be built in the future? Joe, you want to? Uh, let me uh, answer that in two different ways. If you're talking about residential towers, I mean apartment buildings, condos, that kind of stuff. 99% of them are built in concrete, and there are lots of reasons for that. If you have time, I'll be glad to explain that to you. Office buildings, what has happened is uh, in 1968, Dr. Khan invented a new system of building tall buildings, which is called a composite building system. And the first building was actually built in Houston. Uh, that's where I went down. And, but then three first national on Dearborn here was the first composite building built in Chicago. And what a composite building is, is that basically you have a steel building, but the columns in the building, you start off with steel and then you wrap them with concrete. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And the major reason for that is that they save a lot of money. I've co-authored a book on composite design and I've got lots of, I've been doing this for 25 years now, and every time we run a cost comparison in office buildings between all steel and a composite, the composite always comes out cheaper because the concrete that wraps those columns also acts as fireproofing, so you've saved all the fireproofing mm -hmm. costs. So that was invented by Dr. Khan right here in 1968, and he did several buildings that way, and then I took it down to, to the south, and we did a lot of buildings all through the southeast and southwest United States. Okay. Other questions? This is a two-part, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This is a two-part question. Um, everybody knows yesterday was the 18th anniversary of uh, the September 11th attacks. So the first part of the question is, did you guys get asked expert engineering questions after uh, September 11th attacks about tall buildings or about John Hancock specifically. And the second part of the question is, are we building our tall buildings uh, in, a, in a way that they won't come down like they did on September 11th of uh, 2001? Do you want to take that? Well, um, I think we, we could both talk to that. Uh, that was a pretty unique event. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, every building is different, and the Hancock is very different than, than the uh, World Trade Center structurally. And so, um, you know, the, the changes have really been more on, the, on like exiting, you know, more stairs, I mean, sometimes uh, areas of refuge. There's been a lot, a lot of, uh, after, the, hang, after the, the attack, you might have noticed a bunch of planters showed up around the base of the Hancock, uh, so that you can't, vehicles can no longer get close to the tower. And so there, a lot of it was on the security side uh, and, and the uh, egress things. I mean, do you, you have? Uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but uh, <laughs> I spent two years on the World Trade Center collapse. I was the expert witness on that thing. So I, I did a lot of work on that and what caused the collapse. I could talk to you for hours on that. But you've asked a bigger question. Uh, what could that happen again to what we're doing today? And what is happening today is there are certain buildings that are classified as critical. For example, you take uh, US embassies. You have to design them to be bombproof. And several other kind of buildings, IRS buildings and courthouses. So they are designed to be bombproof, if you take that into account. Now this building that uh, the Burj Khalifa that uh, I worked with with Bill Baker, I don't think you even know this, 
I had to sign a secret agreement with Sheikh Mohammed, the ruler of Dubai, and he wanted me to assure him that the building would not be dropped, or a plane could not bomb the building. Uh, that building is all in concrete till you get up to a very high level. But there is a methodology that we use which is called redundancy. And uh, how should I explain this to you? Let, let's say you've got a column coming from the top. What we do is down at the bottom, we put two columns. So if somebody knocks out one, there's still one more column left. That's what we call redundancy, the next column to support it. And on critical buildings, and these are defined either by the government or, but an owner can define it. He says, I want this building to be critical. That's what they did in the Bush Khalifa. And so I spent a lot of time on that one, bomb proofing that building. And there are three levels of bombs. So first is what we call a satchel bomb. The guy walks into the briefcase of the bomb, and that can do minimum damage. He may blow out one part of one floor. Then there's car bombs, which you can come in like the World Trade Center in the early one, the 1994 explosion. The guy took a car underneath the basement, in the basement, and then blew up the whole section of it. And then there's the exterior bombs, like airplanes and all that. And each one of these levels of threat, if you have defined them, we can design against it. But in general principle, the concrete building is the toughest, it's very hard to bring it down. Composite building is next, and steel properly designed is third. But you can do any of them, can be bomb proof. But it costs money, so you've got to use it judiciously. Yeah. <laughs> It's a much more lower level uh, pedestrian question almost, but uh, do any of you have memories of the, uh, I, th I think the, besides the spectacular nature of the tower itself at the Hancock, the entry to the parking garage built mostly out of concrete is its own little gem. I think just the way, I don't know if anybody had done the double helix ramp before that and you can see cars coming across. Does anybody remember? Any little stories about that because it was probably given to some kids too, but it just turned out great. Well, well this little kid designed it. Mike, why don't you talk to that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I designed this spiral ramp in a separate, <laughs> separate structure that, for the spiral ramp to get you cars up to the sixth floor and then across the bridge to the building. And I think the parking was from 6 to 12. The yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were. We had to. We just designed it. It, it was well, reinforced concrete because of the shape. Yeah. It was more. But, but I have to agree. It's one of my favorite. It is a little gem. You know, you could cantilever ramp going out the central court. Cantilever ramp. It's really. And then it sh you shoot across into the into the tower. It's really quite a, yeah. quite nice. And there's an example there of how various disciplines use that. We use it as a, a car ramp to get up there. Uh, in the center also, I believe there's emergency generators, and at the top there are cooling towers. Yeah. So they, not an inch was wasted. Uh, I was curious, I mean, this is in 1969, Previously, the, pre, the world's tallest building was the Empire State Building. Was there any consideration? I had heard something about that. At one point, there was some consideration of actually trying to surpass New York with this building. They eventually did it in 74 with the, uh, or 73 with the Sears Tower. Was there any consideration of extending this building taller than the Empire State Building? Was there some sort of um, deference to New no, York, it was or it's just economics? It was never discussed. It, they, they figured out what, what uh, the size of the building should be. There was 2.8 million square feet in the building, and that's what they wanted. They split it up into office and apartments and parking and all that. But there was no consideration of just arbitrarily going taller than the Empire State. Uh, you know, let me say something about this building. You know, a lot of the architecture out there that, uh, today is, I call it, irrational exuberance, just too much. This building today would be, a, it's very economical, very efficient, very minimum embodied carbon, you know. It was really a very responsible design, you know. And that, that was their ethos of Myron and, and Foz, is to, to do a good building but not be wasteful. It was very, very well done. Joe, we got the last question. I think Joe may have just answered my question, but um, at this time there was a theme uh, in a lot of American architecture, a lot of urban high buildings with open plazas. And you talked about losing the northeast corner, but the whole west side is not devoted to the building. 
and you had a major developer who was giving up a lot of square feet and a lot of rise, would have been a totally different shape. But I wonder if any of you could speak to the thinking around the, the leaving of the plaza versus the building on the plaza. Uh, this is speaking a little bit out of school, but uh, there was a sort of a keen rivalry between the partners of SOM. And there was a gentleman in... <laughs> 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 They're all dead now, so I can speak freely. <laughs> so the, the senior partner in New York was a gentleman named Gordon Buncher, and he had done the Lever building in New York, and then soon thereafter came the Seeger building. And those two buildings set a theme that architects love of the open plaza. So you don't cover the entire site. We have a beautiful plaza that people can assemble on, and you can have fountains and trees and all that kind of stuff. And I remember when I came to work on Hancock that those models uh, that were shown, that one day somebody told me about those two buildings sitting on that, on that plaza. And the one comment I heard was, hey, this leaves no room for plaza because above and beyond these two buildings, you have to build a parking garage. So when you throw a parking garage on that site, you end up you know, essentially covering almost all the site and there's no room for plazas. And they thought Bruce Graham would be hung in a partner's meeting if he came up with a design without a plaza. That was a scuttlebutt around the office. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. All right. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to bring this to a close. And before I do, uh, can you hear me? Uh, I, I was advised to let you all know that we need to leave through Illinois Center. There's a big party um, next door, which is good. We're double booked tonight. Um, <laughs> So can't mingle with whatever they're going on over there. So if you can exit that way. Patel, thank you, Rich, Joe, and Dave, and Bill. Thank you.